I'm one of five writers, five homers for a column in Flag Live called Letters from Home. And I'm going to read a couple of those pieces, those essays. And as I was walking over here tonight, I live downtown, um, I thought about reading to people. And I remembered this man that I went out with once. And we didn't get along at all. But in the evenings, we'd get into his bed, and after doing whatever we would do, he would pick up whatever he was reading from his bedside, and he would read to me out loud until I fell asleep. And there was something so tender about that, even though it was a detective novel, which isn't my thing, just somebody's voice reading something that meant something to them. And it reminded me of being read to sleep by my mother. I think we've all had that experience of being read to by an adult. And there's something so lulling and, I don't know, sweet and soft about it. And so that's what I'm aspiring to. Maybe not tonight, but at some point in my life, I guess I'm saying I'd like to read you all to sleep, but that doesn't sound right. I think you know where I was going with it, but I hadn't thought it all the way through. This piece appeared recently, and that's all I'm going to say. It's called The Parallel Universe. You get the call. You've gotten the call. You will get the call. Mine came from one of my brothers a few weeks ago. Flat voice, naked, no artificial sweetener. You need to get here, Laura. She's in the intensive care unit, and she's not doing well. It's about your mother. It's about your son. It's about your sweetie. It's someone sewn into your heart Someone whose death would unmoor you. Someone whose illness has brought them to a precipice between here and there. And so you go. You answer the call that bends time and edits your life. We all take turns with this, and now it's mine. I'm in the hospital elevator, up against the back wall, shredded from a red-eye flight. I'm rearranging the furniture in my heart to make room for the possibility that my mother might die in the next few days. I smell toilet bowl cleaner and burnt coffee. My eyes are red with deep shadows beneath them. I look like an overweight crack addict. I press four. A woman in blue scrubs and cornrows steps in and presses seven. The elevator lurches upward and pings at four. The doors open. I stay planted, burst into tears. The doors close. The woman in scrubs looks at me, her face soft and searching. I don't know you, but I'm going to give you a hug. She steps forward and wraps her arms around me. She smells like warm shampoo, and I love her instantly. We're going to ride back down to the fourth floor together, OK? She takes my hand, and I hold tight. I murmur a watery thanks and give myself over to her sturdy kindness. I am omnipresent and I am nowhere. I am hyper alert, and I have perfected nothingness. I've been issued a travel visa into what my friend Karen calls the parallel universe. The parallel universe is an ephemeral place marked by grief, confusion, and sadness. It's also illuminated by insight and connection. 
In the parallel universe, emotions smell like burning metal. We don't brush our hair or sleep more than four hours a night. We eat meals from vending machines and stare at clouds for a long, long time. As we move from shock to our new normal, we have difficulty finding most things important. And we don't try to stop crying in front of anyone because we've come to know our tears as tribal markings. Day three or four of the bedside vigil, I leave the building for a walk to escape the beeps and kilowatts of keeping people alive in what my brother calls the intensive scare unit. Skies are low and drizzly with warm rain. A traffic cop with beefy pecs straining his shirt directs cars around a construction zone in the hospital parking lot. I stand on the curb pulsating with gorgeous exhaustion. I am exalted by how life feels. I also hate everyone. Ma'am, I snap to. The traffic cop is standing inches from my face. I'm crying, and he takes both of my hands into his hands. He isn't a prophet or an angel. He doesn't say anything particularly wise, but he keeps holding my hands, and I let him. I feel love surge through me. In the parallel universe, our deflector shields are retracted, and we are gloriously addled with emotional jet lag. We know our sadness is soupy and clarifying. All of our feelings show up in a chorus line, hell bent on their high kicks. Life feels startling and messy, and we widen to accommodate both extremes. In the parallel universe, strangers offer remarkable kindness that I'm usually too armored to accept or ask for. I'm on my flight home. There's no death I'm weathering, but there's loss and there is frailty. The five-hour flight is full, and as the door shut, a flight attendant bends over me. We have an empty row of seats. Follow me. I sleep for a few hours until that same attendant nudges my shoulder and hands me a glass of wine. It's on me, he says. We hold eye contact, sharing the secret of secrets. Are they always around me, these small and surprising kindnesses? Is this world always throbbing with tenderness that can crack my heart open? How can I take some of this way of seeing with me? You get the call. You've gotten the call. You will get the call. Go there. It's fleeting, all of it. I, this room is full of writers. Um, and I honor you. Um, I've never written a story about something so intensely personal that was happening as I wrote it. And I remember when I sent it into Andy Wisniewski, who's the editor at Flag Live, I said, is this too goopy? You have to tell me. And he said, oh no. I had lost my sense of judgment because it was so close and deep. So I read it because it makes me scared and vulnerable and I want to practice that more. This one doesn't. And I don't know why, but it's also about death, um, which I'm finding fascinating these days 
because the more I think about it, the more it reminds me to be more fully alive. And so here's another piece that appeared in Flag Live, and it's called Kevin and Joe. I didn't recognize the incoming phone number when I took the call last week. It was a friend from college days. He and I have kept in touch over the years, but he lives in Florida. He's not a big Facebook guy, and it's been three years or so since we've seen one another or conversed. He called to tell me that Kevin, a mutual friend from our time together in college, was found dead in his apartment tall, lethally irreverent, and good-hearted. Kevin had a head of hair that adhered to its own aerodynamic principles. His synapses ricocheted at speeds I will never approximate. He was a welcome satellite in a tribe of journalists and photographers who worked at the campus newspaper. Instead of majoring in journalism, as the rest of us were, Kevin had chosen pharmacology. He said he wanted to be nearer to the drugs that had the capacity to mute or flash fry his zigzagging mind. I sat in my vacuum sealed car on the side of the highway. Cars whizzed by and made the world blurry as my friend and I traded stories of those gonzo swashbuckling days. When we hung up and the laughter stopped reverbing, I felt the faucets shut to all of my feelings. Or maybe the faucets open wider and everything I felt flooded my senses. I spent the rest of the day in a high functioning zombie trance which is the less formal term for the onset of grief. I recognized the incoming phone number for the text I received the following morning. It was from a friend from my Miami days, the city I migrated toward in my early 20s. My friend and I were part of a feral posse who helped colonize Miami Beach when the city was on the cusp of rediscovery we were all pre-marriage, pre-mortgage, bulletproof, and on fire. She called to tell me that Joe, one of our gang from those days, had died of a heart attack a few days earlier. Joe is an artist whose apartment was a clubhouse and whose warmth softened everyone in his orbit. I watched both men and women fall in love with him as did I. When I first met Joe, he told me he was accepting applications for a girlfriend, and he urged me to apply. The back-to-back -back deaths of Kevin and Joe was a one-two dead friend punch that sent me spiraling into nostalgia. I spent the next few days drifting into my past, a glorious, ornate library with lengths of bookshelves. Inside the books are chapters in my own handwriting, poems and laughter, streaming images and music. I pulled down book after book, rereading, reawakening, reliving. Then I saw Kevin and Joe doing bong hits, making fart noises, and rolling their eyes. Get out, they both said. I unstuck in time and spiraled into the future, fingering at the off-ramp of the present. I veered in and out of a cloud pattern that was a sky-written question from a Mary Oliver poem. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Everything was wide and filmy. Kevin and Joe were there, eating fortune cookies and flanking Alex Trebek, who held note cards with questions that all asked versions of the same thing. 
I don't need a decoder ring or Sigmund Freud or Deepak Chopra for this one. The way I see it, we're all afforded the opportunity to move through some version of this when someone passes. I'm not interested in nominating Kevin or Joe to be canonized, nor am I enamored of an extended crying festival. What I choose to think about instead is that Kevin and Joe were alive and we were together for a while in this world radiating aliveness and they both seemed to be living ferociously and I got to be near that and be part of that. I got the chance to love them and to be loved by them. These days, the deaths of those I knew and loved carry with them the expected spectrum of sadness. But more important for me, they impart an urgency, a gorgeously clarifying reminder of the ultimate deadline. They help me see the arc of my life, and they encourage me to remember the fleetingness of it all. Their deaths whisper to me, get off your ass, my friend. You have only one wild and precious life. Hours have passed. Let them spur you to radiate more deeply into yours. Thanks for your attention.